Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome at this real fine, on this real fine occasion when the political sciences and legal studies departments of, of CEU uh, bring here for, for a lecture not only a, a really wonderful scholar and speaker, but actually a long time friend and, and colleague, Martin Krieger. And he comes from Australia formally, which doesn't sound very exciting to people who want to hear about the rule of law because everything seems to be properly in, in order. But uh, those of us who know him um, have known him from the early 1990s when he first came to Hungary to Collegium Budapest and met with uh, a group of enthusiasts and dreamers and got hooked on what we call Central and Eastern Europe and transition to democracy and the rule of law. And instead of giving a formal CV for Martin, partly because I'm dead afraid to speak before him, it's difficult to speak after him. So what I will do instead of an introduction, you will know what I mean, I am going to read out something from his very own civil passions on how does he come to the matters he discusses for us and with us. So this is from the essay called Hybrids and Comparisons. And this is Martin Krieger. My parents arrived here, that is Australia, during the Second World War, Polish Jewish refugees from Nazism. Their lives, families, friendships, and countries were ripped apart by the war. Both my mother's parents and her brother were murdered by the Nazis. Other relatives spent years fighting or being imprisoned by them and what was left of the family was disbanded around the world. My parents were from Poland from necessity, arrived in Australia by accident, and I stayed because after the communist takeover of Poland, they couldn't go home. I mention these far from exceptional facts, not to claim some exotic authority for my views, nor in accordance with the budding Australian tradition to launch a prize-winning novel but because they inform the way I think about things, what I think about, and above all, what I think matters. Combined with my birthplace, they have made me what I am, a congenital cultural hybrid, a hybrid from birth. So let's hear from Martin Krieger. Thank you very much. There's an Australian version of hybrid which is bastard, or mongrel. Mongrel is actually the technical Australian term, but only my enemies reminded me of that. Thank you, Renata, and thank you for having me and letting me speak here. I've, Budapest is, has a very nostalgic space in my life because in that year, in 1995-96, uh, a lot of things happened to me and my wife psychologically, and a path which could have gone anywhere, maybe should have gone elsewhere, became to encompass or be focused on things happening in this region. And much that I'll say today, even though I'm not going to be talking specifically and explicitly about regional problems, unless they pop up, as they may do, uh, much of what I have to say is generated, uh, maybe inspired, by matters that occurred here or that I observed or, or that uh, left me to think that not everybody, everything that was tried here was tried with, in relation to the rule of law, my subject, an ideal conception of the subject. Let me start. It's a, how can you stop me starting? It's a common tendency among technical professionals to see what they do and where they operate, the way they operate, as the centre of the world. So accountants see bottom lines and dentists see teeth and drills and uh, plumbers see taps and sewers and people with hammers see nails and lawyers see the central offices and institutions of law. That's a kind of harmless and fairly general foible that people tolerate and largely they ignore it until they have a problem. If their teeth hurt, if their sewers overflow, if they go bankrupt, if they want to avoid jail, they come to take a certain respect for the narcissistic foibles of technical professionals 
and they enter their truths. They take those truths, the truths of professionals, as being the obvious truths. And if your ambition is to generate the rule of law, then it seems, has seemed to many people that the obvious truths are the ones in the heads of lawyers. It certainly seemed that way to lawyers and to those people whose profession is parasitic on law, legal philosophers. And so if the rule of law is what you want to think about, where else to look than the institutions and practices deemed central by lawyers and philosophers to, those, to the activity, to the significance of law? What I want to do in this talk is suggest that this is a way of uh, operating that starts in the wrong place. In fact, I think it starts in two wrong places and moves in the wrong direction. And I'll start myself with those places and try to move the discussion in a different direction. But just to give a little concreteness to what I'm talking against, if you think if you ask the question, what's the rule of law, it seems to me that three sorts of answers are typical. One, which was uh, codified, if you like, by the great English constitutional lawyer Alfred Dicey, who influenced then generations of other English lawyers in popularising the conception, the rule of law. He identified this, asked what the rule of law is. He said two somewhat contradictory things. He said, first of all, the rule of law is a trait of national character, very easy to observe, but very hard to specify. And then he spent the rest of what is much more famous by specifying it. And he specified it in terms of three elements, and I won't go into them now, we can come back to them. Each of them uh, distinguished for its parochiality and uh, self-serving Englishness. The rule of law was something which suddenly would drop from your list of possibilities if you moved even just a little to the right across the channel. These three characteristics were characteristics of English law and the rule of law required those three characteristics. Now I'm caricaturing as one does, or at least as I do, but this notion that the rule of law is to be identified with a specific set of institutions which can be which are both general in significance but able to be specified in quite c concrete terms this is something which didn't end with dicey but has been emulated by lawyers after lawyers when they talk about the rule of law when they treat to distill or seek to distill its essence and also when as in the last 20 years, rule of law has become a vogue around the world, when rule of law promotion programs are generated, these have typically, and only until recently, uh, without much um, anxiety, been distilled into checklists of legal procedures, characteristic institutions, and so on. Now, legal philosophers, of course, are a distinct breed. Uh, they don't get in for concreteness very much. That's not what they do. They go for larger, more general conceptions, which have, in the uh, classic uh, enumeration of the Harvard jurist Lon Fuller, led to lists of the characteristics of legal rules. They should be prospective, public, uh, not uh, clear, not ambiguous, not contradictory. There are numerous such lists. People vie with, in the number of characteristics you can add to the list. And the, among themselves, people involved in the rule of law legal philosophy business may argue about the list. And so for, uh, Fuller's formal list has recently, and I think interestingly, been supplemented by uh, the now Oxford and NYU uh, legal philosopher, political philosopher Jeremy Waldron, who has added important other procedural, as he calls them, dimensions to the rule of law. Now, all of these things, I don't want to dismiss them, but I want to suggest that particularly when the rule of law has, as it has, in the last 20 years, become an extraordinary, extraordinarily successful hurrah word, and when rule of law promotion has become, if not at all successful, 
but a very busy international industry, that to start in this way is a misguided way to start. I want to suggest it's misguided in two respects. One is, the, but uh, believe me, I'll try to explain it because it'll begin rather cryptically. One, it starts anatomically rather than teleologically. And secondly, it starts and focuses far more than I, I believe is appropriate on the inner workings and description of legal institutions, practices and rules, and far less than is appropriate on trying to generate or develop a socio-legal understanding of the way that law might work in the world. I'll take these separately. First, teleology versus anatomy. The lists that I've talked about are a way of answering the question, what's the rule of law, by giving features of institutions, characteristics. As you would say, well, what is a bone? Well, it has it's a bit hard, it's a bit whatever you say a bone is. An anatomist will tell you this is a bone, this is a, this is a blood vessel, and so on. And so the rule of law is anatomized by most of the people who discuss it. It seems to me that this is a very, very mistaken way to start. Not mistaken to think about the anatomy of the rule of law, but that's way down the track. More important in the beginning, crucial in the beginning, is to ask, what is the point of this activity? What are we after? What is it that the rule of law is thought to be for? I think it's important, I don't think it's just logic chopping, because unless one clarifies what one has in mind as the point, the telos, of the rule of law, you won't have, you will be flying blind in picking the institutional characteristics you pick, and you will be limited quite often to institutional characteristics when it seems to me more important to be looking beyond them. Why do I say this? Well, I've got three reasons to say it. One, the rule of law is a concept unlike the concept of law in this respect. Actually, even the concept of law is uh, controversially something, and it's only positivists who believe that an anatomical approach to it is the best approach to it. But the rule of law is clearly something which incorporates a value. It's more like the notion of hospital than the notion of pebble or the notion of stone or rock. The rule of law, when people demand the rule of law, when people recommend the rule of law, this is not just saying you should have more pebbles in your, in your garden. This is saying some result is important. It's, it incorporates, the rule of law starts with an ideal. Of course, we can argue about what is the significance, what's the right rendition of that ideal. But that's where it seems to me important to start. It's an ideal which has, and I'll move to that significance later, in common talk, uh, Waldron recently said, it's not obvious why Joseph Raz's understanding, it's not obvious that Joseph Raz owns the rule of law. Other people have title to ownership, and that might be ordinary people who, who <coughs> might use the phrase or might yearn for the achievement. And if that is something you want to take your bearings by, then it's unlikely that those ordinary people will spend as much time on the formal characteristics of legal rules or the particular nature of legal institutions. They will have, I want to suggest, more in mind an ideal of a state of affairs in the world. A state of affairs in the world where it makes sense to say, to put it in shortcut, law rules. Or, to expand it a little, an state of affairs in the world where law makes a difference, of course I'm being stipulative here but I think I'm tracking something, law makes a difference to the way in which power is routinely and possibly exercised. The difference that I think is strong in the rule of law tradition, that the rule of law one hopes can make, is that it limits the possibility of exercising arbitrary power. Now we can argue about that and it's worth arguing about at the level of ideals but what my first point is simply 
that notion, that concept, already incorporates some ideal of what it is for. And until Wade argues, tries to clarify what we think it's for, then we won't know how to adjust or discriminate between various lists of characteristics as are offered to us by rule of law proponents. So first of all, there is this conceptual matter, but secondly, there's an empirical matter. Very often, when people give lists of characteristics of legal institutions, right at the centre of it is independence of the judiciary. Absolutely. One of the gold standards of rule of law is judicial independence. And yet, I've just come to Hungary from Bulgaria. And one of the complaints I heard most stridently by people that I interviewed was that following the South European model, the Bulgarians uh, gave their judiciary strict independence and added within that uh, the independence of the procurator. And many complaints were that this independent procurator was a constant undermining of the possibility of non-arbitrary exercise of power. In my brief period back here in Budapest, I've had the chance to read uh, Professor Fleck's argument on the Hungarian judiciary, where uncannily the same argument is repeated. And it's, a repeat, it's an argument which was already uh, foreshadowed by, at a more abstract and general level by Stephen Holmes in his contribution to a festschrift for Janos Kish. And if I can just read a passage, which I just happen to have on my person, from Holmes, he said, we need to avoid what in many post-dictatorial countries we have, uh, when judges are rendered independent, an autistic corporatism disguised as liberal orthodoxy and increasingly common in transitional regimes. Uh, many of, I mean, many, anybody who's looked at the literature on the region knows that there are all sorts of specific difficulties to do with holdovers from the four, foregoing uh, regime, which are now uh, irremovable and ineducable because of judicial independence. And of course, judicial independence speaks to a real and important value that you want in legal orders. You want, you need, for a restraint on arbitrary power, that the people who enforce and interpret the law not be routinely subject to leg telephone law, to leaning on from various sources, etc. But to think, of course that's a value and it's important to institutionalise it, but to imagine as a great deal of, for example, survey research on items of good governance do, that if we have judicial independence, we have this signal marker of the rule of law, is to mistake again anatomy for teleology. And one third argument why I'm hostile to a way of thinking about the rule of law which begins with anatomy rather than beginning with teleology is that it generates or it spawns one of the great vices of all organisations known to every inhabitant of a university or a modern university but not only to them and that is Goal displacement. Every organisational theorist will tell you that a, a, a central and repeated characteristic of uh, bureaucracies is that the people who work within them come to have far more affection and familiarity with the particular institutional bric-a-brac they're dealing with than with whatever it was, who knows, that led to these institutional forms being institutionalised. So for these reasons, I want to suggest that there is a lot of goal displacement that goes on in rule of law promotion activities. I don't have a recipe for curing it, but it does seem to me that one of the central reasons for that is that too many people receive checklists or make up checklists and think that in that way, somehow one has approached the rule of law. So that's that starting point. There's another starting point. In 2005, 2006, I spent a year in the Stanford's uh, Center for Advanced Studies, and in those centers, or in that center, you have people, typically, who do a whole range of different things. And one of the uh, 
uh, people that was in my cohort was a, an American health sociologist, James House, who had, has apparently the best data on the American health system that exists. And I didn't imagine that he and I had anything in common except that we played table tennis together every day. And that, but over time, and then listening to his seminar, I discovered that his theme, the theme of his research, or the question animating a lifetime's research, is that why is it that the American health system, which spends more per capita on health than any other country, does not, to say the least, have better population results in health than comparable countries. In fact, according to his work, countries comparable in relevant respects, America was not only not the leader, but in many indices was slipping. And he argued that, contrary to a lot of thought about these matters, that uh, American health deficiencies should be made up by more investment in hospitals, in technology, in, uh, in training of technical professionals, that rather one should look to matters to do with socioeconomic conditions, with education, with a whole range of social and political matters which surrounded and were fed by the legal system, but in which health was either found or not found. And that reminded me of a tradition which actually comes out of the region, of this region, but which is in, encapsulated in a remark or an observation by a modern, one of the few actually modern self-conscious American inheritors of that tradition, Mark Galanta from Wisconsin, who observed once that just as health is not found in hospitals, primarily in hospitals, so justice is not uh, found primarily in justice dispensing institutions. And of course he's echoing there, self-consciously, Eugen Ehrlich from uh, the town variously renamed, known now as Chernovitz, which when he began teaching there was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, then while he was still teaching there became part of Romania and is now in Ukraine. Like him, but not, I think, uh, influenced by him, in Russia and Poland, Petrajitsky was, was, was intrigued by what he called intuitive law. Just as Ehrlich said, there is living law out in the associations in a society and one shouldn't be obsessed with the law for decision which governs the activity of legal officials. So Petrajitsky asked that we take seriously intuitive law. And of course Malinowski, who comes from the same, well, comes from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, went to my country. And then, this is how a civilized country operates, by the way. He went to my country in 1914 as the secretary of the Oxford anthropologist R. R. Marat. But because he came from the Austro-Hungarian Empire and war had been declared and he was an enemy alien, our, my government had to know what to do with him. So being respectful, they asked what he would, he, would he like to do. He said, well, I'm an anthropologist. I'd like to see the Trobrin Islands. So that's how this whole bunch of uh, discipline defining works was written. He went to the Trobrin, Trobrin Islands and he said, and he sought to, to establish that the life of law is not simply limited to what he called codes, courts, and constables. Now this is a tradition which suggests, and I think it rightly suggests, that many of the important, most important activities we associate with law, that are affected by law, that affect the quality of law, are only to be gauged in depth and with insight if one looks beyond the activities of the central institutions of law. And so it seems to me that given that a socio-legal uh, inquiry into law is very rarely associated with thought about the rule of law, or has traditionally been very rarely, 
but that's a deficiency to be uh, overcome. And I won't overcome it, but I'll simply suggest that somebody should overcome it and some of the things that might be relevant to that task. Two preliminary observations of a very banal sort, the sort of thing that as soon as it's said, everybody knew, of course that's true, there's no news there, but it's relevant to keep in mind in relation to our topic because it seems to me that it's often not kept in mind by lawyers and those most closely associated with rule of law promotion. And the first of these is that what we often refer to offhand as though we're talking about one thing, a black box, society is not a vacuum. And it's not a single thing. It is a conjurie of associations of people in groups, surrounded by other people in other groups. Those groups not being the simple atomistic whirrings of individuals, but organised by, within, what one legal anthropologist, Sally Falk Moore, called semi-autonomous social fields. Moore, in some lovely work, showed the extent to which the normative signals sent in one's work group, in one's ethnic group, in one's religious work, various associations, so influence a great deal of what we take to be doable, undoable, not to be done, worth being done, worthy of support, and so on. It's a general truth. I mention that because often when people write about uh, clientelism or networks in the region, they write as though this is a speciality of the region. Only when you get to the Balkans do you really have networks, unlike in America or Australia. There are no networks. It's just the sovereign rule of law, but of course that's not true. In Australia and America, they're not the same networks, and you can make significant distinctions among networks in terms of uh, the weight of their influence on members, and in particular, I think also, in terms of the existence, the, the degree to which they synchronize or subvert central institution. But all societies are networked societies. And that means, secondly, that a key, a key operation necessary for generating the rule even of state law not an operation, sorry, a, a, key, a key accomplishment or achievement or, or state of affairs is one where the central law is in sync with important but not centrally generated normative orders, semi-autonomous social fields. Many of the problems described of Russia, oligarchs, of... Uh, Bulgaria, wrestlers, but not only wrestlers, uh, organised crime, other groups. Many such problems have to do with agents of influence, in a term different from the way that term was created, other than central agencies. Now, this is terribly vague. Uh, let me make it a little more vague. Uh, the jurist whom I mentioned, Lon Fuller, you probably, sorry, you probably know that in, in the West there is what is now called the Law and Society Movement. There are a lot of centres called Centres for Law and Society. There's a Law and Society Association. There's a Journal of Law and Society. Fuller thought this was a misdescription. And it sounds like a small terminological uh, amendment, but in fact there's some insight in it. He said these should be called the Law in Society Associations. He says because it's not as though you have this thing and this thing, and you wonder how they get together, but law ultimately is intermixed indissolubly with, with uh, society. Now, again, that is all very vague. Let me try to specify it a little more. Uh, this is one of those moments where a person who speaks without notes realises that's perhaps not the best way to go. Uh, if the law is... It's one thing to say society is not a vacuum. 
it has these things, but of course it has central law. One point, again banal once made, but I think so important, is that within this society, within any society, most of the uh, potentially law-affected behaviour goes nowhere near legal institutions. That's a truism of socio-legal research. People describe the legal disputing pyramid, for example, that I won't go through it all because it has this kind of... There is even a language, um, naming, blaming, claiming. Each of these takes you a bit higher up the... If you, something can hurt you, but you don't know it's something you can blame anyone for until you identify it. Uh, a culprit, which people didn't do with smoking in the West until a long time ago, and in Hungary any day now that will happen. The people will think, oh, not only do, do I cough when I smoke, but it may be that the cigarettes are harmful to me. And when that happens, you've got, a, you've got something to blame. And when you've got something to blame, you might claim. But you don't always claim because the person that did you the damage may be more powerful or important to you. So you lump a lot of things. You don't claim them, but then you claim them Often you claim them at a personal level, but if you don't claim them at a personal level, you might go to a lawyer. You go to a lawyer, sends a letter, all right, you get the picture. Ultimately, some of this vast universe of potential claims gets somewhere near a legal official. But then, usually, most of them get dealt with by lower legal officials. And so, you get up to the pyramid, at the top of which are the legally most important decisions, legally most important, which are very variably the socially most important decisions. You know why they can be more important? Because the, the legal order has to obey them. Very often they're not sociologically, at least they're not quantitatively certainly, and they may arguably not be sociologically more important. And a second point flows from that, which is, uh, has been made, I think, with most insight by Mark Galanta, whom I mentioned. He says it's common to talk of central legal institutions as though they were magnets for disputes in a society. Official, third party, or you've got a problem, you can't deal with yourselves, they're magnets. He says, well, if so, because of the first point I made, they're very inefficient magnets because most things don't go there. Secondly, it would be terrible if there were more ambition, efficient magnets because we couldn't cope with the vast range of potentially law-related matters that might go there if they did go there. Does that mean the central institutions are unimportant? No, on the contrary. They're important, but in a different way. Instead of being important in a, I always get these two words mixed up, in a centripetal way, that is, they suck material, relevant material in, they are centrifugally important. They throw messages out centrally, but not only, by the way they deal with cases. Of course, legislation throws messages out, that's what it does. But case law throws messages out. Some of those are the intended messages. These are your rights. Many others are unintended. It's going to cost this much, it's going to take this long, it's going to cause this much aggravation. Or people like your, like your sort of people don't do well here. All sorts of messages can be sent out, and they are crucial messages. And they are crucial for the extent to which there is what Fuller called fidelity to law, there is a sense that the law is your law, there is also a sense to which people gauge their activities, plan their lives, in some significant way affected by the messages from those institutions. But thirdly, the quality of these messages is, or the, sorry, the, the receptivity to these messages, the way that these messages are received, is out of the central institution's control once they're broadcast. Then we know, and again it's a banality, that the world is not full of people with their ears cupped waiting to hear the latest uh, declaration of the, even the European Court of Human Rights, may I say, let alone other, about which I'm now expert, but um, rather than other institutions. If you take into account Sally Moore's observation about the extent to which we live in a whole conjury of semi-autonomous social fields, 
then it is the interrelationship, the consistency and the mutual supplementation on the one hand or the absence of any of these on the other which between what is being felt from the fields in which one, with which one was most closely associated and from the central authority which determines or generates the extent to which whatever goes on up there has its echoes and resonances down here. And finally, these are, as I mentioned, general truths. They're not truths simply in a region, but the way things pan out in terms of the play and significance of central law to people's lives varies dramatically uh, from society to society. But even within a society where there aren't the pathologies of hostile or, uh, or anomic or completely disconnected fields which the law seeks often vainly to penetrate, the general point I want to make is that because law is not, to use a, ter a distinction of Stephen Holmes's, law is, if it's a technology at all, not a production technology, it's an interaction technology. It's a, it's a technology, there's a lot wrong with that word, but it's a way of doing things, a way of generating norms, whose only significant effect is the way that they affect interactions among people that it cannot control indefinite numbers of people who are supposed to be cued in by it, because that's the case, then I think it's significant for us to... Well, I think it's true. I also think it's significant. That many of the major goods... Da sorry, major sources, dangers, and goods of the rule of law can only be assessed and only will be achieved in this wider social realm rather than in the institutions. Just a, a, a small prefatory point. Uh, I've been looking at a lot of uh, post-conflict rule of law promotion in societies like East Timor, which is close to me, I mean physically close, uh, in, in South Africa, in Afghanistan, and there's a new fashion, which I'll come back to right at the end, in World Bank talk, which seeks to acknowledge some of these points. And the way that it's acknowledged is to say, look, we're focusing on the wrong place because 80% of disputes are handled by traditional uh, dispute institutions, not by the uh, imposed new institutions. And I was taken in by that for a while, and I thought, well, they're saying what I'm saying. And then I, I realised, no, they're not. I, and I, started, I asked at one such thing, where do you get 80%? Why not 63? 20, 42? We're 80. And to the extent that that term had to, could mean anything, I think the only thing it could mean is that they are still in thrall to the magnetic view of law. That is, they say, look... 20%, we deal with 20% of the cases that we find dealt with. We find that there is this tribal thing. They deal with some others. Now, dealing with disputes by a third party is an absolutely significant element of law, but evading or diffusing or avoiding the need for disputes is a fundamentally important part of living in a rule of law society. Going out with some confident reliability that people you don't know have the same idea of what is on uh, as people, as you do, is an enormous rule of law accomplishment in some societies. It's not a question then of different magnets for different disputes. It's a question of the extent to which <coughs> law-related behaviour responds to legal signals. I said the major good, uh, sources, dangers and goods are generated in the wider society. And let me briefly uh, mention those three categories. 
sources we've already talked about, to the extent that the rule of law depends on a significant synchronization between what is generated in networks. They may be what the Polish sociologist called networks, uh, uh, Adam Podgorecki called networks of dirty togetherness. To the extent that your ruling <coughs> networks are networks of dirty togetherness, then you've got a legal problem. But they may just be networks where many of the signals sent locally are consistent with the signals sent uh, from the centre. But whatever the case, it's important what happens out there, not merely what happens in the centre. Secondly, dangers. I mentioned that uh, Jeremy Waldron, in a number of recent articles, has some really, I think, made a move forward, as he so often does. Uh, He's taken the various accounts of the rule of law, which have been very common in legal philosophy, that it's a matter of clear, prospective, consistent, not ambiguous, non-contradictory, etc., rules. And he says, look, that's what legal philosophers talk about. But what I, I think, I, Waldron, think, the rule of law, as we understand it, has to track the rule of law as people understand it in societies where it's lacked, in societies where there may be claims made for it, and in other societies, or in underprivileged places, or maybe privileged places in our own societies. And he said, much more close to people's thoughts about the rule of law is their concern that if they come before the law, they're treated fairly, they are given a chance to make their case, they are treated as a person rather than, as he puts it nicely, a dilapidated house or a rabid dog. And he says, therefore, we have to place a lot more importance, emphasis, on the procedural quality with which the law treats people. I think this is an important and salutary amendment to a kind of ruling convention. But if you really want to be close to where people, I can't speak for the people, but where a lot is missing when you don't have the rule of law, it's not even for the reasons I've given when, courts, when people come to court. It is in the extent people feel impotence in ordinary relations, a sense that the law is the last thing I can go to to help me in this case because I'm down here. It's when uh, there's a common knowledge, sometimes false. As in Bulgaria, some people said to me, look, it's not as bad here as people say, but they say it. That is, we will never get anything out of those institutions. But you find that there, and many of the harms done to people in life, which the rule of law, were it effective, might be an antidote to, are harms done by other powerful private people or groups or organisations beyond the ken of the law. Again, in Bulgaria, people say, well, look, in, in, in Sofia, it's like this, but it's a different world in the villages and provinces where no one can control what goes on. And finally, goods. Uh, Almost everybody, and I won't be invidious and pick those who aren't, almost everybody in this room is too young to remember a major uh, controversy that erupted over a book by the very distinguished historian E.P. Thompson, who had hitherto been famous as one of the most uh, distinguished Marxist, uh, English Marxist historians. Published a book called Wigs and Hunters, which was pri uh, most of it conformed to general Marxist accounts. It was about a series of capital uh, statutes, <coughs> making a capital punishment for, uh, for poaching in the lands of aristocrats. And the, the, the Thompson story, eloquent as always, was a fairly conventional story. There was a ruling class. They were screwing these people. At the, last, the end of the book, he develops an encomium praise for 11 pages in praise of the rule of law, which he calls a cultural achievement of universal significance. He says, the rule of law, the restraint of arbitrary power, or he has more eloquent terms than those, is a cultural achievement of universal significance. Well, liberals can say that. That's what a liberal does. And nobody notices if they're of the Marxist left at those days. But for a Marxist, high priest to say it, was 
treason. And he was treated as having, uh, having become at least a heretic, maybe an apostate. In those remarkably eloquent pages, he argues that, well, the law is, obviously the, is often the ideology of a ruling class, but because it's that sort of ideology, it can tie their hands. And if you asked, if you look in Thompson, well, wh what did he see to be the sources of these uh, benefits of the rule of law? He didn't name particular institutions. He thought they were bent, they were in, dominated by the ruling class. What he insisted on was that what was distinctive of 18th century Britain was that the peasant who fought, or the poacher, who fought for his rights believed he was fighting for his rights because this was his understanding of what he was entitled to by law. In a faraway country from which I come, uh, there was, well actually in Britain, there was a celebrated case. Uh, a man called Henry Cable was jailed. It was a capital offence, but after the American uh, War of Independence, many people who might have been shipped to America were kept in England and the, there was not enough space. And so he was to be transported to Australia in the first fleet that came to Australia. In the meantime, he met and fell in love with <coughs> Mary, and they had a child. And they were to be transported, but the people running the prison said uh, that, you, that they couldn't be transported because, uh, sorry, said that they could be transported, but not the baby. They were terribly distressed. Uh, prison warder was sympathised with them. He galloped to the governor. In the meantime, there was a newspaper campaign about this. A lot of money, 20 pounds I think it was, but I'm told it was a lot of money, was gathered for them. And they were allowed to take the baby and they bought things with its 20 pounds provisions. This came on a second boat to Australia, a long way. When Henry and Mary came to Australia, uh, they asked for their possessions and the captain of the second ship claimed not to have... Uh, not, not, to, not to have them. So the first civil case in my country's history is Cable against this uh, captain, and he won. And there's a story about why did this happen? <coughs> Let's imagine that it was a Russian fleet or some other country's fleet. The story might have been different because he felt, he was a convict, he knew something about the law, uh, he felt that his rights had been abused. A whole range of players were constrained by things in their heads, which had come with them to this faraway place of which we know nothing. And uh, maybe I shouldn't have launched on that story, it's taken me too far afield, but the general point I'm saying is that there is a great deal of, we say cultural but it's a weak word, supports important for the rule of law, which again are not primarily generated by the particular design of particular rules and institutions. I'm coming to the close. Uh, just to draw together, what all of this suggests, perhaps at too great a length, is that far more systematic attention and needs to be given to context and to variation. Once you allow that context is significant, that even if institutions of the same formulation are taken to different places, they'll perform differently from where they came from and from other places, then two things follow, I think. One is that the particular recipes that we have for rule of law need to be examined in context to see whether they're appropriate to deliver the value I've been talking about which is the only reason to strive for, or among the only reasons to strive for the rule of law. And secondly, if you take, if you start with some conception of the telos, of what you are that you think law might make a difference to, then there is no a priori reason to stop with legal institutions. Given that many other things affect the outcome, then you're going to have to be much more uh, aware than lawyers are, maybe than anyone is, uh, of 
those sorts of matters. Well, what's this involved? What does it mean, then, to promote the rule of law as is such a big industry in the world? Is it invention? Is it copying? Is it emulation? Is it mimicry? There's an old metaphor which has occasionally resurfaced in legal thought. It was already in Aquinas when he tried to explain how there were two ways of drawing a conclusion from premises. One was you have axioms, you deduce it. Another one he called interpretatio, interpretation. Uh, sorry, determinatio, determination. You have a general idea, but you have to bring it to bear on a particular place. And he gives the example of an architect. He says an architect might have a pretty clear idea of why he wants a door and what he wants the door for, or a whole range of things. After all, an architect has to know the difference between a house and a barn or whatever else. So there will be certain important general things which anybody who promotes the rule of law needs to have in, to have in account. But then to bring them to bear in a particular place, in a particular time, requires much more than this simple general institutional model. An architect, for example, needs to know at least two things. He has to know something about the terrain where he's building whatever he wants to build. He has to know quite a lot about those, the weather, the, the terrain, whether it's he's building it on sand or on quicksand or various other things. And he'll also have to know something, which can be affected by terrain, of the tastes, predilections, expectations of the people for whom he's building. There's a Bulgarian saying, which I've just confirmed last week, that, but I've been using it for 20 years before the confirmation, so <laughs> I'm glad that I have confirmed it, that the law is like a, 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 a door built in the middle of a meadow, of a large meadow. Of course, you could go through the door, but only a, f a fool would bother. Why go through the door? You can go around it. And if you start to think, why in a society do people think that way about law? They may think, well, that door is not for people like me. Or I've heard that when people like me go there, no one hears about them again. There are all sorts of reasons. Or I can do it better this way. I know how to do it outside the door. I've got other things. There's a Polish equivalent. Oh, it's not an equivalent. Uh, but it's close. Uh, the law is like a, a paling fence. A tiger, sorry, a li an eagle will fly way above it. A tiger can jump over it. A snake can slither under it. And for the rest, the bidler, bidwo is Polish both for cattle and for beasts, the ordinary bidler just go on as before. Now, to the extent that that characterises the society in which you're seeking to implant, generate, catalyse the rule of law, that is, not just a bunch of institutions of indeterminate consequences, but a state of affairs in which the law contributes significantly, never on its own, to the restraint of arbitrary power, not just state power, but the power, arbitrariness is not a bad, my children, when they were little, are pretty arbitrary. We consider that cute. They don't consider it arbitrary when I'm, sorry, they don't consider it cute when I'm arbitrary. Actually, cute is not a word they use in this connection. But uh, as they grow, their arbitrariness becomes more threatening. And as I grow old, my, their arbitrariness becomes more damaging. So it's not arbitrariness on its own, and it's not power on its own. We need power. We need institutions with power. We have people with power. It's that combination of arbitrariness and power which is such a threatening part of the human predicament and which the rule of law has, in specific cases, uh, been a mighty uh, antidote to. But it needs a great deal more thought and different sort of thought, it seems to me, to, uh, bring, it, uh, to bring it about. Now, there's good news and bad news this year. The World Bank issued this year, in 2011, its World Development Report, and for the first time it said two things. It said that we're giving up 
I didn't say giving up, who, must, who admits a mistake. Uh, we're moving from best practice to best fit, which is nice. And secondly, we're looking from uh, away from the justice sector, the justice sector, to issues of social and economic justice. Also nice. They haven't done it yet, and I think it's a large discussion what they have in mind to do it. On the other hand, in March 2011, the Venice Commission issued its, as it put it, consensus report on the rule of law. This is what everybody, what unifies all the traditions of the rule of law, Rechtsstaat, Etat de droit, Etat de um, Stato de diritto. And if you look at the list, it could have come out of Fuller, it could have come out of Dicey. It's, a, it's, it's an unexceptionable in old style terms, but unadventurous central institutional list. So it seems to me more work has, been, has to be done, but I'm told to stop and I won't do it tonight. Thank you very much. success story of rule of law promotion, then somebody would say, look, this is just typical academic uh, word embroidery. But we're not in that state. I mean, a lot of money and a lot of effort and a lot of thought by clever people has been devoted to rule of law promotion. And I think that there are fundamental conceptual mistakes underpinning a lot of it. And so if you ask a bad question, you're going to get bad answers. I don't have good answers, partly because I came into this in a sense by accident. I said that what these thoughts, such as they are, were generated or prompted by um, looking, maybe it's better if I, I stand on them, by some observations of the region. But they were initially theoretical reflections prompted by some rather haphazard observation of practical matters. That is, I, for a range of reasons, had always been a strong proponent of the rule of law. And there was a time in the 80s and before that when, among people who talk about this thing, that was not a, a popular position because the critical legal studies were very hostile to the rule of law. Marxists, of course, were hostile to the rule of law. And I, because of my interest in despotism, <coughs> but somewhat hostile interest, uh, kept sort of boosting the rule of law. But I, said, I had nothing, I, I wasn't at all concerned about what the rule of law was. I just assumed it was what we all said it was. And it was only after the collapse of communism 
and efforts which I supported as enthusiastically as anybody else to bring a whole range of measures and after the relative, variable but considerable disappointment with those measures that I started to think that something was wrong. Not as a practitioner but somebody who thought among the various... This is hard, we know that. And we know that uh, it's never going to be easy because so many things are out of your control and so on and so forth. But I thought, think, that a range of related conceptual mistakes mean that the more you keep running in the same race doesn't mean the, the quicker you'll get to, to the conclusion. Um, if you follow the E.P. Thompson you know, unqualified human good and the, the root of law has this self-hostaging aspect to it. Maybe, I mean, this is a bad question, but I just wanted to ask whether um, you could say a bit more about the disappointments as you saw them. So what are the repercussions or the consequences of this I don't know, fetishization of the rule of law or the industry of the rule of law? Well, one, one consequence is, is disappointment. And it's a disappointment which is very often cast as a disappointment in the rule of law, where I think it can be, should be, typically, cast as being disappointment in misguided or failed or inadequate attempts to generate the rule of law. There is, uh, uh, what's his name? can't remember his name, but uh, in a book edited by Carruthers, there is, no, it's a book edited by Shire, so I should know that. Uh, uh, but it, I still I can't remember the author. There is an article criticising the rule of law, and there are quite a few such articles. Look, the rule of law just isn't what it's cracked up to be because all of these things go wrong. Now, I think that if you, if you begin with an ideal... There is always the danger of saying, well, you haven't really tried it, as we know. Communism wasn't tried by the Russians because they shouldn't have done it. They did it the wrong place at the wrong time, etc. But if it had only been done in Switzerland, it would have been terrific. Um, by the Swiss cheese-eating proletariat. Um, the, but I do think that it's a sort of self-fulfilling disappointment to say the rule of law brings us nothing because we've done it and still people are crooked and so on and so forth. I think it's a separate issue to talk as a real problem, because it is a real problem, often in Western countries a problem of the right, fetishisation of the rule of law. And that is where you say that you rule out options, other options, for example, social welfare, welfare state, etc., on the grounds of an alleged uh, inconsistency with the rule of law. But there, I think often it's the same conceptual mistake. And I follow this quite, quite a bit. Uh, sorry. Um, often in Hayekian and other, or maybe mini Hayekian, <laughs> uh, critiques of welfare state, they are cashed out in terms of a fairly vulgar conception of the rule of law as being a matter of pure generality. So, when, the, when you, the, the attack on the, the rise of the administrative state and discretions and regulations and less no ability and so on, often it's as legalistic as what I've been saying here, as formalistic. And there the question remains, for example, the Hayek, question to Hayek is, if the, if the um, what was the great book of the 30s, the something state, um, the road to serfdom. Well, no one took the road that he was warning against. The great totalitarian catastrophes never went down his road. They came from other sources, not from a welfare state in decline. But many critiques of the welfare state have said, for reasons internal to the legal order, the form of law is being eroded, and therefore it can't do the rule of law jobs of signalling and 
clarifying and stabilizing that we need. And so there is, this is a kind of context-free claim, and it's a terribly common, or sorry, it was a very common claim in the Hayek made it, Unger, interestingly, from the other side, endorsed it. He didn't, didn't have the same affect for him, but he said the welfare state has made the rule of law impossible. Uh, my mentors, Kamenka and Tay, made, wrote the same article 27 times saying that point. And it was all a kind of highly internal disquisition on the formal character of the rules in that case, in institutions, spawning new institutions, tribunals, this, that, and the other stuff. Now, to, to assess that in terms of the state of affairs in the world that we make sense of by saying the rule of law is strong here would require far more of the sort of work I'm suggesting than, than we get. Uh, a friend of mine, Gianfranco Poggi, did a, a book recently on, on Durkheim. He has a nice phrase. He says, for Durkheim, society, which of course is not just a mob of people, society is an insofar as reality. That is, you've got people. It's a society insofar as certain results have been a regular, common mental representations and so on. I sort of think that way about the instantiation of the rule of law. And maybe ultimately I should give up, and that's what I'm starting to think. I should give up trying to defend the rule of law and just write the, the thing beyond the rule of law. Because it, it's this result that seems to me important. I don't care how you get to it, but I have a hunch that law is an important part of it. And that result includes things like uh, stable, generally widely known rules of the game which uh, enable routine interactions and unfearful interactions in normal circumstances. You can elaborate it. But it's that result which seems to me important. It's just that I believe that law has something to do. We don't have that many tools in this place or in any place and so law is an important part of it. But to not be... Yeah, well, I'm now starting to repeat myself. Not for the first time. Uh, if nobody is brave enough, then you, you, you will <coughs> understand your point a, a bit. And I wonder what is our contribution to the demolition of a brain concept. Because, I mean, we, through the war in terror, we saw the great contribution of the US. So it would be refreshing to, to get your sense on how did we manage to dismantle something which looked that looked very valuable 20 years ago. Well, uh, I don't think you did. I think the world is a... There are a lot of places which are screwed up. And in, uh, in the most recent multi-country, 56-country research that I know about on quality of democracy, which, among other things, uh, a friend of mine in, in Warsaw, Radek um, Markowski, is involved in, I only know the results have not been fully processed. But this is what he's told me. He says one of the things which is striking is that he claims it's a methodologically enormously sophisticated study with a whole range of indices of various sorts, out of which two things, one gratifying and one disturbing, well, he said many things, but two things come out. The gratifying one, standing in this room, in this place, is that on these quality of democracy plottings of 56 countries, there is internal variation in the region, but most of the region is doing pretty well compared to other countries. Most of Latin America is doing pretty badly. And one of the things he wants to try to think of an explanation for, he doesn't know what the explanation is, uh, is why there should be this disparity. And I only report him because I'm not brave enough to say it in the first person. He's worried that he might, in the explanation of this, have to say, it's never come out of my lips before. There may have been something good about communism. The educated population, <laughs> the sense of it. I didn't say it. Markovsky said it, and I'm just repeating it. You kick him. Um, I have no idea what the, the explanation is, and I haven't even seen the data, etc. That's what he said. So I think um, 
I think that one of the measures they have is a rule of law measure, but it's, it's that standard sort of rule of law measure. The dispiriting thing is that the various measures they have for quality of democracy overlap almost perfectly with measures for anything like uh, economic, if you've got a GDB, a certain height, and various other things, which makes, it may mean, don't listen to anything I've said, just don't try anything, unless you get rich. Well, that's uh, something which it's hard to embrace with enthusiasm as a strategy. My question is, if we, if we adapt a social legal approach to promoting the rule of law, and if we are to see it in a broader perspective and follow this truth, isn't there a risk that um, <coughs> would allow law to intrude and penetrate into every aspect of our society? So it would be like uh, the World Bank and uh, the life would be not only would they be talking about the courts next time around, they will be they will be going about telling this is how this fear of life and so isn't there a risk or am I just uh, overblowing it and exaggerating? Empirically, I don't. Of course, there's the risk and and. It's a common risk, it's another sort of vulgarisation of the rule of law, that the rule of law means there should be more law regulation in your life. I think a lot of the implications, if anybody were to be persuaded by me, and so far I am, but the, the club is a small one, that you're welcome to join. Um, but if people were, were, were to be persuaded, then I think that there really would need to be work done on what are the implications. I don't think, I don't think there's any, I think it's possible that the implications would go in completely the other direction. They, they might say, look, uh, there are other agencies which should be supported, for example, or that if this correlation with, with economic conditions, that one should be putting more money for rule of law reasons into things that we do or don't put in for health reasons or for, for welfare reasons. So I'm not, I, I don't see that it follows from this that to say that there are other things which contribute to the chance that power can be arbitrary, that arbitrary power will be lessened, that this means in a sort of quasi Foucauldian way everything is to be treated as an agency of power which might be enlisted to generate this new thing. I don't think it follows. I don't see that it follows. Uh, I think I should probably start this position. I was wondering to what extent you actually disagree with this yeah, anatomicist. Yes. <laughs> Uh, no. Because what they can say is, some, is that uh, so you want to change people's reasons for actions and give them some sort of assurances. That's the goal of the rule of law. And then what they can say is that they agree with that. But they just, just say that these checklists are more likely to, to do that, what you want to do. So they, say, they use something at different levels. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good question. And it's one that I was saying to Renato the other day that I think I'm sometimes. Uh, I worry that I'm deinstitutionalizing much more than I want to, and particularly in the light of some of the stuff by Tom Tyler, a social psychologist. Tyler has done a lot of work which I can't assess, but it sounds, it seems to me very, uh, uh, very impressive, and it's certainly very influential on why people obey the law. And the, uh, sta the, the sort of overarching answer, which he thinks is overwhelmingly supported by data in many countries, is that people obey the law even when they have lost before the law to the extent it's very much like a kind of empirical uh, 
uh, confirmation of, of Waldron's position to the extent that they believe they have been treated with fairness. And so you could, following your question, say, well, look, uh, how else can you do, can you project that message than making sure you've got these central institutions which do that? Uh, I think that my answer is, is maybe twofold. One, that if you thought about um, these institutions in those terms rather than commit what I describe, well, I haven't described it as the magnetic fallacy, but it is what I think it is, that is the notion that these are primarily magnets, things would look different. But secondly, there is the whole story of the interaction with things out in the society which uh, the checklist people have nothing to say about. Nothing. And I think that's an important part of the story. The answer is yes and no. Uh, I, I did a piece once which was called Institutional Optimism, Cultural Pessimism and the Rule of Law. And that was directly after I was here because I met so many examples of each of those types. There were can-do reformers who had the checklist around. And there were uh, deeply intelligent, highly pessimistic uh, South European intellectuals who said you can never do it here. And I wanted to, I, I think that you would have to break down the claim in which I think there is a lot of wisdom, but I think it has to be broken up and disaggregated. I think national character is just too gross a category to do any work. But I think traditions aren't traditional practices. And I think culture, for a range of reasons, can be a very misleading uh, uh, concept. Fundamentally because, and this is why I can't answer your last question, it pretend, often it's thought that if you label something as cultural, you have in a sense said it can't be changed by non-cultural things. Well, the Taiwanese were not always capitalist, nor the Chinese, so, and they're not even Protestants. So clearly the Protestant ethic is not the only way to get to... So these things are important. So you would have to break it down a lot. But uh, I think that traditions, it's, it, it's a very complex category, but one aspect of it is that uh, culture too talks about as though it's just here, but tradition has in it, conceptually, that traditional things are not things, if they're traditional rather than simply historical, a kvinkum is historical, but for me it's no part of my tradition. Uh, it's not just that it's from the past. There are things in a society's practices where the past has present authority. And since 23rd of October is coming up, then in Hungary we can understand that. Uh, but I had to be told it was 23rd of October that was a significant day. So I think that all sorts of traditions, both because a lot of traditions are simply, in the old meaning of prejudices, 
They are ways we do things here which nobody individually will rethink. It's very, it takes a lot of jolting for those weeds to be moved around. But then if they have a kind of special authority or apparent naturalness, these are, there are social reasons why it's hard to shift all that. It's hard to identify it and it's another reason why uh, institutional transplants even apart from this wider stuff that I've been invoking, institutional transplants pick up visible features of practices which themselves, in their place of origin, are usually encased in ways of doing things which are not easily formalised. They take them to countries which have their own ways of doing things which are also not formalised. It would be surprising if the institutional performance were the same in both places. There's a, a very interesting sociologist who works on law, she's at Oxford now, but she's an Armenian, Marina Kurkjian, and she did a recent article on, it's a bad example since, it's about the English Press Council, which has a certain different tonality after the affairs of my compatriot than uh, it did a few months ago, but when she published the article, the English Press Council was a deliberate body to deal with press complaints in a non-formalised, non-legalistic manner. And two groups from two towns in uh, Russia, a, a grant was given, they were to emulate this. And the, there, were, there were training sessions a number of months in, in, in England, there were training sessions in sight, there were supervisions, and these two, in I can't remember the two towns, but two different towns, she argues, had as their basic rationale, without anybody actually working it out, exactly the opposite of the model on which they were based. The English Press Council was supposed to be alternative dis uh, dispute resolution. These turned out to be highly formalised, highly formalistic, highly legalistic, all sorts of, if you, if you're talking about defamation, you have a professor of philology who is important to tell you what this word means. And so, uh, now she tries to explain that in terms of broader culture, not legal culture as the culture of lawyers, but broader culture in these places. And I can't follow the explanation to its details, but I think there are so many reasons why what is there uh, fundamentally affects what can easily be implanted. And I think that it's... I used to think that um, pessimism was... I'm sorry I'm rambling, but I've been listening to myself too much. Uh, so it can't be good for you. Uh, when I started thinking about this, uh, uh, political scientist at Berkeley, Giuseppe Di Palma, published a little book, and I, I'm not sure it had much influence, but it was, I thought, impressive, called To Craft Democracy, or Crafting Democracies. And the first chapter he begins is called Hard Facts. And he argues there that there are plenty of these hard facts which everybody, the Balkans, oh, the Balkans and so on, uh, but hard facts are really often facts, but their hardness doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean difficulty is negative determinism. And I drew from that, particularly at the time of the early experiments where all sorts of people were already surprised by what, after all, who in 88 predicted 89? I certainly didn't. Uh, a few people in jail, like Adam Michnik in, in Poland predicted, but I, I thought of him as just an admirable romantic, not, not serious on this issue. And so I, I've come to a position which is Programmatic pessimism can only be justified when other people are being screwed. Uh, if you really have a theoretically watertight case that good things are impossible. Now, after 20 years, I also worry that uh, too much enthusiasm and a kind of can-do uh, optimism sometimes can generate consequences which maybe one should apologise for. Um, I have a question. I'm sorry, but it's too obvious to give me the answer, but 
I would like to ask about the opinion of, uh, of the Supreme Court of the country I come from, so from Poland. Um, and uh, the question concerns temporal aspects of, of, uh, of the rule of law. Uh, in 2007, the Polish Supreme Court passed uh, the decision that uh, a judge who sentenced people during the marital time in 1981 cannot be found, uh, cannot be, um, be liable for those, um, those uh, things because in, when, in the time when he was applying this retroactive uh, law in 1981, there was no rule of law in, Polish constitutional, in the Polish constitution. Um, and because of rule of law that uh, exists in nowadays Polish constitution, uh, the Supreme Court could not somehow retroactively uh, apply this rule of law to the situation in 1981. It was very broadly criticized in Poland by Professor Zajan. He said like he denies the, the idea of Radnuk and its um, legal injustice. And I would like to ask you about your opinion uh, on this decision. Is this rule of law in, in present Polish constitution somehow does undermine the, the, the idea of transitional justice in, in the post-Soviet uh, to give you a satisfactory answer, I'd have to have read the case. But I do know the issues a bit, partly because they were not alien to the great debate in the 50s between Hart and Fuller. Uh, they were not doing it then in terms of rule of law, but in a sense they were. Fuller was, anyway. Uh, but it was a very different take from the one you've described from the Polish court. That is, Fuller said that uh, laws taken or purported to be valid under Nazism were often not rightly called laws because of the, not because of their content, but because of their formal degeneracy, not a term he used but what he was saying, that is, to the extent that the legal order was full of retroactive laws, of secret laws, of power in the streets, of a whole range of things, the fact that it's called law and had the form of law and had a pedigree as law, for him, would not uh, warrant calling it law and therefore would not warrant the person who had made use of it or the judge who had applied it in saying, well, I was just doing what the law required. And so he then said that uh, a post-Nazi court would be authorised retrospectively to uh, undo the consequences or at least give reparation for the consequences of that. And then I do know the differences, or I did once, know more closely than now, between the approach of the Hungarian Constitutional Court and the Czech Constitutional Court to a similar question. I don't remember that there was any... Uh, that is, statute of limitations and, and whether the act of the later court would be in violation of the rule of law uh, in acting retroactively. Another part of my story, which is not this sociological one here, is very much influenced by Fuller. And that is, I don't have a, particularly since I don't know the facts, I don't have some recipe answer to your question, but I would want to be open, and I think courts should be open, in a way the Hungarian Constitutional Court was not, to the possibility that court, the fact that your action is retroactive may be in itself unfortunate, but it's not the only misfortune in this game, and maybe not the most important one. There are circumstances, Fuller insisted on this, Fuller after all hated retroactive laws, and he said that a system of retroactive laws was clearly not a, a legal system. But he said, there are circumstances of legal injustice where a retroactive law might be necessary to cure the injustice. And he would tolerate that. But if it became systematic, then it would underlie, undermine it. And I think that, well, again, without knowing the particular fact, I'm tempted by this kind of reasoning, partly for the reasons I've given. That is, I don't think that a fetishization of is it retrospective, is it clear enough, etc., is a way 
intelligently to think about the rule of law. I think that it should be more open to what are the implications of this, the larger implications of it. So I would like to thank the happily exhausted Martin for not only the lecture but, but the answers and also Francis for chatting and those of you who stayed with us and invited further outside. So thank you very much.